Okay, so as uh, we uh, meet sort of Thursdays on usually the last Thursday, but as I said the last time, we have a few sessions which are back to back every Thursday, and this is one of our second ones. Um, as you can see, we had a meeting on the 23rd, then this today, second, and then there's another one following up on the 9th, and they're all around assessment and innovative uh, technologies around assessment and the challenges around assessment. And today with me uh, is uh, Luce, uh, not Lucinda, but Edith, um, who is uh, our communications officer for the All South Group. And uh, they will be in, uh, in future events, Lucinda, who is our secretary, um, who looks after membership. So if just a quick show of hands of people who are um, new to this uh, and they have possibly not joined yet our working party on, on different changes. If you if you are new to, to, to those two things, you know, not just new here, but also not join the, the working party yet. If you have, then I, I thank you for doing that. But if you haven't yet joined our working party, I'll, I'll remind, uh, I'll give you the link if you if you wish to join later on. So, um, but it looks like uh, the people mostly are not uh, yet part of the working group. So that's, that's great because uh, we are looking for people to join from all institutions across the land. So well done for, for joining us and um, it'd be even better. Oh, look, Lucinda is here, so there you go. Um, yeah, I didn't see you join Lucinda, sorry. Um, okay, so we have uh, the full pack here. Uh, all of us are here. Uh, if you want to join, drop drop Lucinda the line email and, and she'll make sure that you're on, on our All South mailing list and, you know, well, with the group. But uh, let's not uh, go in too much into detail of joining because this is easy from the website. Our events are here uh, listed. Uh, people are here um, who will be presenting on, on the coming Thursdays. The, we haven't quite fixed after the 9th of March, which we will advertise the dates. Um, so the following people will be presenting um, different things around assessment. So there's a range of mm, uh, interesting events for you to, to come and, and join and be party to. And as I was saying earlier, they, we launched last time, uh, we met uh, the working party whose objectives it is to, to make um, assessment more inclusive across institutions in, in the UK, if possible beyond as well. But uh, let's just keep our, our heads focused within the country first. Uh, it's a big enough task. <laughs> and we need all, all, all people who are, who are listening to us right now, uh, either on live or on recording. So be you all welcome. Um, what we will do is we will share practice like for today, Sarah and myself, we're going to share some practice and some lessons that we learned within our institutions um, through the pandemic and uh, basically meet regularly around the area of uh, making changes um, and, and supporting people make changes around assessments and making them more inclusive um, and work with uh, bodies like the professional bodies, uh, regulatory bodies, as well as QA. Advance HE, TESO, etc. And one thing we will do is we'll be uh, forming a group uh, within this larger group to look at systematic review on specific um, inclusion areas and specific outcomes. So if you wish to join us at a later point for a training uh, in systematic review or be part of helping us train other people in systematic review, please let us know. So we will. Uh, definitely um, be in touch for for that and we aim to produce some evidence uh, from the literature but also from different organizations that we all work in so if you haven't already joined I can post this link into the chat and uh, please do sign up and you will be kept up to date uh, on all our activities and all our um, yeah events so what I'd like to then do is to begin by uh, talking about our sort of shared goals that we want to be guided by uh, as, as a group. Um, I recently did a, a training session with the higher education, the Advanced HE, um, and uh, I came across this uh, acronym, the JEDI. And uh, so I'm, I'm using that as our guiding principles. Um, goals 
so for example justice it's about who loses out in different assessment designs equity uh, is talking about um, are we creating any systemic barriers to prevent someone from from excelling diversity is still talk, talking about do we know who we are assessing is if there is diversity do we know each one of the the groups uh, or or are we unaware of something uh, inclusion kind of asking the question have we considered everybody's perspectives are um, and and also quite important is the academic integrity um, as a guiding goal because if we are talking about assessment then this this becomes very important and not only in its own self but also are the jedi uh, um, action points that we we take on and we implement are they then compatible with the academic integrity that results from such an assessment and likewise vice versa so if these are our short term or let's say medium term goals the reason i'm saying that short or medium is because if it's a long term goal then then we are we're not achieving any change what we want is these goals that we are able to make assessment more just more equitable more diverse suited for more diverse populations um and is inclusive and so on um so yeah so we want those to be our short and medium term goals because we want to achieve them and and, and then move on to something else and hopefully we'll make that make that possible um through your help of course um so the way we do it is by taking a snapshot of where we are at the minute so people who are joining our uh, working party when in their own institutions in their own practice we would like them to to start sort of taking a snapshot of the current picture if there is any so let's say let's just pick justice for instance if there's any awarding gap and and if so is it what is it about is it about social and cultural capital mental health disability whatever it is you you take a snapshot then and, and then try and affect that through um in, in interventions and uh, better design of assessment etc and then keep on uh, capturing it over a shorter period of time and monitor it over a short period of time to see if you if you're making change and then if you have success obviously come back and share it with the rest of the group and if you haven't got success and you want ideas again come back to the group and and discuss and and be um you know by sharing the problem obviously we we we, we, we might be able to solve it better okay so th these are some of the other areas as well i won't go into each one of them but it's important that we take a snapshot in our own practice and around and try and affect the change um by 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 doing something about those things and 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 uh, yeah collectively if possible uh, otherwise so the part of the the reason why we uh, doing these sessions right now is to is to do that sharing of the practice bit which both myself and and sarah will be talking about today sarah will be running more of a workshop and i'll just uh, quickly summarize what we have as a, as a practice that uh, we learned things that we learned over the pandemic about examinations so that could be an option for other people to to, to see and and pick things from and and try and change practice within their own institutions um and likewise sarah has many uh, ideas and examples to share as well for today but if likewise you have those ideas please come forward and and let us know so we can uh, run more of these sessions where we are doing the sharing of the practice around inclusion um, in assessments as well okay so so that's that uh so I'll, I'll quickly just uh, run over my own um, example within my school we have been running exams like any other school uh, in engineering and uh, this is a typical engineering sort of control diagram really so control is not my subject area minus telecommunications but uh, you know i understand this Oop, where is it going yeah there you go right so what you see here is in 2020 just before the pandemic uh, hit us well at the time when the pandemic hit us we changed we everybody had to change their exams we had lots of exams and we had to go open book obviously um they take away take it at home that kind of exam our exam design uh was informed by a bit more than what i say here as basic but uh, i in fact released a, a document uh, which was systematically uh a systematic review of the literature where we came up with some guidance on on designing exam papers 
uh, for this kind of settings. But um, I'm, I'm trying to say that, okay, you even with the guidance, you can't get it right the first time. Staff are still learning. And you, you, you notice that the, the averages kind of shoot up. And uh, what you do next is you try and react to that situation. And I think similar story I was hearing in other engineering departments too. Um, you you create, uh, you give less time to the students and, and you make the questions more uh, hard or, or according to the guidance that, that we all um, had at, to our disposal. Um, that could result in an undershoot, like the exam averages kind of dropping. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, you learn from 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 this experience. And when you when you have done it a few times, you know how to make it just right. How to how much time to give to students. What is allowed? What's not allowed? Uh, even when even today, when the pandemic effects are are over, we we still have open book examinations in our school, but we give them no internet access. We allow them to bring their handwritten notes specifically. We, Currently, we say bring whatever, but we are moving towards a direction where we're saying do bring handwritten notes only because that enforces that people are are able to summarize their knowledge and themselves rather than just relying on books. Um, but in other institutions, what my what I've also noticed is that as coming back into the um, the campus, but still still the exam is uh, take away take at home. And uh, disruptors like check.com or in chat GPT in, in the future could could cause these overshoots and undershoots uh, uh, with reactionary um, steps like closing the uh, exams to to what they were before the pandemic, you know, making them close book again. And many people have done that. And having done that, they may have seen an undershoot on the averages or poor performance in the exam and so on and so forth. But I'm hoping that uh, if we were to keep the, the learnings from, from the pandemic with us, we will see uh, a better sort of stable future. Now, these uh, smiley faces are, are from the point of view of the uh, disabled or sort of inclusion point of view. Um, so we, we noticed that over the last few years, we had increased uh, or sort of closed the gap uh, between the, the disabled and the, um, the non-disabled. Uh, in terms of the awarding gap and our assessments tend to be about 60 to 70 percent exams uh, so we could say that that may be an underlying reason uh, but equally if you um, look at the situation in places where they have gone uh, from uh, open book to closed book that's sort of certainly uh, closing the doors to some of the people who May have certain disabilities about maybe let's say memory issues and processing and so on and so forth so so that's where 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 we are at and at Portsmouth. the next week we are going to talk about some other uh, examples from Portsmouth uh, with regards uh, chat gpt and things okay so without taking more time i said I'll, I'll i'll stop at 15 past 12 so i'm going to hand over now to our uh, guest speaker sarah broadbury who's uh, in the School of Animal and Rural Environment uh, Sciences at Nottingham Trent. And she's a principal lecturer, uh, along with her colleagues who have joined us, uh, Samantha Reed and Melanie uh, Veloratne. Is that uh, correct pronunciation? Uh, but then, yeah. So if I hand over now to the three of you who would be taking the rest uh, of the, the the time for the workshop that you, that you promised. So over to you, uh, Sarah. Thank you. I'm just going to share my slides, if that's OK. Yes, I will stop sharing my network and work out how. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> if you can, you can see my slides, can you? Yes, indeed. Perfect. Thank you, Manish. And um, apologies for anybody who's not from Nottingham Trent, but we, we like pink and Nottingham Trent, so it is quite a bold colour. Um, but to say thank you to Manish and colleagues for giving us the opportunity to um, share some of the, the learnings which we've had from the pandemic and some examples of where we've moved to more of an authentic work like assessment and the impact that that's had upon, upon our students. Uh, so I'm joined by Sam, who is a learning teaching manager as myself in the business school, and also Melanie, who's one of our educational developers as well. So they will be supporting me as we move through this. 
Um, just to, I suppose, give a little bit of an introduction about the context in which we're, we're, we're talking about this. When we're talking about authentic assessment, we're talking about assessment that calls for students to utilise that same set of knowledge, competencies and attitudes that they should apply in the criterion situation in real life. And our, our feeling is that in terms of inclusion, traditional exams present barriers, but also as we start moving towards trying to hit things such as graduate outcome surveys, we need to think how can we develop students' um, skills uh, beyond just knowledge recall and recognising that assessment in itself is actually an important form of learning for students as well. So Nottingham Trent University is a post-92. We're the sixth largest university in the UK and we're one of the biggest, if not the biggest, campus recruiters of UK students. So 70% of our students come from beyond its region. So we pull students from a very diverse range of backgrounds and we're seen as being one of the major skills importers into the East Midlands. Um, we have around 40,000 students and staff and we're spread across six university sites, um, five of which are throughout Nottingham, and we now have Confetti London. Um, so we, we, we're certainly very, very diverse. Eight different academic schools covering a very broad range of, of subjects, um, with three specialist hub campuses as well, where we're very much working on the levelling up agenda, and again, really trying to support that diversity and encourage students to maybe undertake um, higher education that maybe previously haven't, haven't done so. So we think it's really important that we, we think about how we assess our students. We recognise it, as I said, that it's an important form of learning. Um, I feel that the pandemic actually was very good for higher education. I appreciate it was stressful, um, but we've learned an awful lot from it. Um, our digital skills, both for ourselves and our students, we saw rapid upskilling. And it seems a shame to lose what we what we gained from that. One of the approaches within our university was to look at our exams and consider how can we assess those learning outcomes whilst moving away from that traditional exam, given the constraints which the pandemic introduced. And um, again, linking to this graduate outcome survey and this need for our students to have an authentic learning experience, we started to explore real world work life authentic experiences. Um, so we work closely with employers. We have employer input in terms of a lot of our assessments um, to make sure that we are providing that authentic opportunity. I will admit from my own discipline, which is um, I'm in the School of Animal, Rural, Environmental Sciences, with the exception of veterinary nursing, we don't necessarily have students going out into a set profession. They need a very, very broad range of skills. And that can sometimes make it challenging in terms of how do we prepare them for a workplace, which is incredibly diverse. Um, I wondered whether we'd hear the word chat GPT um, and I think we, we got in around 16 minutes before Manish mentioned it but we know that chat GPT um, academic integrity is very much high profile at the moment but I'm personally in the view we need to embrace it um, technology moves forwards we need to think of how we can use it as a learning tool and what we don't want to see is a knee-jerk reaction back to traditional exams in exam halls. We will lose that richness of the authentic assessment experience but also the, the advances we've made in terms of inclusive assessment as well. Um, and what we really want to as well do is reduce pressure on our students. We are in a um, mental health crisis, I suppose, in terms with our, our undergrad students. And we need to think, why are we adopting these approaches, these traditional exams, if there may be better, more effective ways to um, determine their learning outcomes and also use those assessments as a form of learning too. So it's given us a really good opportunity for us to think about how can we strengthen our, our assessment portfolio? How can we strengthen our teaching and our assessment to enable um, removal of some of these traditional barriers which we do see around traditional assessment. Uh, as I said, just to, to set the context, we are um, a post-92 um, and as you'll be aware, we have the access and participation plans um, set by the Office of, for Students, which we need to, to be looking at reducing these attainment gaps, these non-continuation gaps, to enable us to charge the higher rate fee. Um, so we have a, a moral and a social obligation to look at this. What we know with our students is we have a very high degree of intersectionality. So at the moment, we're very much looking at how we can um, 
assess to reduce attainment gaps, for example, in, in black students versus white students. But we know it's far more complex than that, that we have this intersectionality that a lot of our students will enter through a non-standard entry route. So that will be city and guilds, BTEC, um, rather than A level of a level routes um, within my school we actually deliver FE on site so therefore we have a much higher proportion than across other areas of the university of students progressing from that that further education those BTEC city and guild approaches so we have we have a lot of diversity within our curriculum we know students coming through this non-standard entry route have less education opportunities um, we see that um, they also have less cultural capital and therefore, we need to provide those opportunities where we can within the curriculum. So again, working with employers, building that social that social capital to enable them to actually um, have the same level of attainment and graduate outcomes as students may be coming through that that more um, traditional route. We also know that around a quarter of our students actually come from households with a combined income of 15,000 or less. So we have a lot of first generation students joining us. So inclusion to us is embedded throughout all of our, our curriculum. And what we really want to do is look at approaches that connect students with re real world practice. Um, so this work is looked at by Forsyth and Evans. Um, and obviously this is building on this increased um, need we have to ensure that our students are going out to graduate level roles and so the better we can support them this with this the greater hopefully we, we can appreciate those metrics we know that metrics um, are very highly influential in what is a rapidly changing sector um, and as we move towards marketization of even more we need to ensure that we are enabling our students to compete with those which are maybe coming from from different sectors so we have around 40,000 40, staff, as I said, um, and across a very, very range broad of academic provision. So the rationale for wanting to move away from examinations is just because it's been done that way doesn't mean that it's most appropriate. And this can sometimes be uncomfortable decisions, decisions to have. And we need to make sure that the, the value to both the students, the academics, but also those, those employers very clearly communicated. So our assessment really needs to consider the di diversity of students. We are seeing a rapid change in our student body in terms of they are often working additional roles to enable them to have the income to enable them to come to university. And we're seeing changes in qualifications, etc. So things are only going to move forwards. And if we look at the work of Dolmage, for example, we can see that this traditional exam route, which we see in some areas, um, more so than others, can be viewed as a form of almost ableism in practice. So even by their very nature, we're excluding students. We know that this kind of change, as I said, is uncomfortable. We will face resistance. Um, I first met Manish, I presented with Sam at the QAA PSRB forum, really trying to overcome some of the challenges which we have. So in my area, one of our PSRBs, requires um, an exam for every form, for, for every module. And again, we need to be rigorously challenging this and saying, how can we, if we are doing this, how can we make this more inclusive? But what alternatives can we, can we actually go for? So we know that some cultures will see disciplinary cultures of resistance and some traditions this may be just a lack of understanding of good assessment but we we can't just sit there we can't have this inertia we need to, to be pushing forwards we know that authentic assessment will improve students engagement um, my own studies have shown that we've increased attendance which i know is of major concern in the sector at the moment but we've had significant improvements in attendance um, in engagement of students outside of the classroom as well. So with our, our now our virtual learning portal, but reflected in actual satisfaction. So potentially we'll be feeding into NSS, but increases their employability skill too. So if you haven't seen the paper by Sagbana et al from 2021, it really lays out the benefits of authentic assessment, that it helps to develop, 
develop students communication skills and we'll give you some examples today their critical thinking and problem solving skills but also that collaboration um, I very much rely on team-based learning I'm a very big active collaborative learner um, learning uh, adopter of that, that pedagogy and you can see it in the student that we can link this in with both formative and summative assessment but developing that self-awareness and self-confidence and as I said if you think back to those student characteristics that we have within Nottingham Trent University we need students to maybe be able to develop that cultural capital to have that self-confidence to go out and compete for for graduate roles and when we look at the world economic forum in terms of those 10 skills needed to thrive in 2025 from their future job survey we can see that traditional exams maybe don't develop and have that same learning opportunity they want analytical thinking and innovation. They want active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, and creativity, originality and initiative. These are things that maybe are more challenging to assess in a traditional exam. And therefore what we're going to present today is a range of case studies from across the university where we can use this authentic assessment as an alternative to exams to try to really prepare students better for, for the workplace. So just as an example, in my school, um, so we're very much a rural campus, um, so quite a lot of practical underpins a lot of the theory. And one example we've seen here, which has worked incredibly well, is actually bringing in an employer to collaborate with students um, on a topical issue so that they are set something by industry. The students work with that employer over almost a patchwork text approach throughout, throughout several weeks of their, their module, understanding the topic more fully, generating outcomes, whether that's that outputs, whether that's videos, whether that's scientific right, um, scientific communication, so that they can actually then communicate and actually holding a knowledge exchange event with the local community. So that they are working with potential employers, but also that we have that community engagement. And the feedback from the students has been overwhelmingly positive. They appreciate the chance to work with a leading employer from, from the UK. We talk about how that can help to develop that emerging, that pre-professional identity and how they can also include this on their CV. And, and it gives them that, that confidence to go out and to talk to um, future employers and showcase what they've done within that, that curriculum. So assess work-like -like experiences embedded across all of our courses, or increasingly so at Nottingham Trent and again, preparing them for these, these graduate outcomes. So moving away from these traditional exams. And this allows us through this authentic assessment to align these graduate skills, these qualities, behaviors, values, and standards to, to professional roles within a very, very diverse sector. At this point, I'm going to pass over to Sam. And, and Sam's going to talk through a whole range of other case studies within the university. And then we're hopefully going to collect some of your thoughts, some of your ideas, um, which then Manish and I can look at how we can take forward and, and incorporate into the working party. So Sam, are you happy for me to move the slide on? Yes, please. OK, there Thank we you. go. Thank you. Thank you. So as Sarah said, I'm Samantha Reeves. I'm the Learn Teach Manager within the Business School within Nottingham Trent University. I'm just going to run through just over some typical kind of case studies of how we've included authentic assessment within my own school, but then also across the other schools as well, the Nottingham Trent University. So with the pandemic, what the decision we chose to make within the business school was to give colleagues the option rather than having an open book exam to have what we termed on the day timed assessments so this particular form of assessment was brought in so that colleagues could look at their current assessment that would have traditionally been a face-to-face -face exam and see how they could adapt that to be a work-like task to be completed within a particular time frame and what this led to was innovation in how could we look at the skills and the competencies and the particular strengths we wanted students to be able to show as part of that assessment rather than root learning. And we continue to look at on the day time assessments post pandemic and we're now undergoing a review of these to see what kind of forms have been used as part of this assessment strategy and how we can continue to innovate 
um, as part of these on the day timed assessments. So examples of what these on the day timed assessments might be, um, for instance, could be that students are given a particular set of data and they've got a, a time frame to work with that data to analyze that for a, a company um, to be able to suggest improvements or make recommendations based on that raw data and this would have traditionally been on the exam format questions around a set of data but through the on the day type of assessment they're now having time to be able to analyze that and come up with their own conclusions around that in order to answer the set of questions and to do their own research within that time frame and um, which they wouldn't be able to do before and this has been used across our, our different departments we have five different departments within the business school and it could be that we're replicating uh, a, a task that might be within a particular graduate role so it could be for example uh, for marketing communications that there's a crisis situation and the student's got so long to be able to put together a communication response to that for a particular organization so it might be putting together a press release for example or um, a social media post or a, a blog post and they've got time to kind of research into what the implications of that crisis might be kind of applying the, the theory behind that and, order to, and then providing a justification for why they've put together this piece. And what it's doing is, is giving autonomy to the students as well to be able to present that in a different way than just sort of writing as they would have done an exam. And uh, we did some research into this to see how students kind of responded to this sort of on the day times assessment approach. And what we found was that students felt a lot more comfortable, a lot more less stress at being in this environment because they could kind of control a bit more about how they were putting together their assessment rather than having to remember lots of information as they might have done in the exam. And the response we've been getting from um, employers as well, so we took it to our, we have an Illumina Fellows network and particularly within the business school, what they were saying was that what it's enabling students to do is to be able to come into the gradu graduate roles, uh, come into employment, already having looked at some of these typical tasks that they would do um, within the organisation. So particularly around uh, data analysis is particularly important for our students. And by having that data there or having to find that data, they're then able to respond to that in a more authentic way rather than just being given a graph that you that they have to comment on they're now having to put that together to create something so that they can then provide as their justification uh, we also found that for students as well that they they felt like it was more had more value because it, it felt more realistic so the sort of task they would be doing and we're able to kind of level it looking at the different levels and in terms of how we build up those skills throughout their degrees so that again they could kind of gain confidence through the assessment process and get ready for that assessment uh, rather than just focusing on how they could sort of cram for an exam. Um, do you want to go to the next slide Sarah please? So in the School of Architecture, Design and the Built Environment, uh, we've particularly been including lots of input from the external stakeholders in order to ensure that the approach is authentic and that it is in line with industry standards. Um, so for this particular school, using the contacts in a way that's allowing the industry to interact with the students throughout the process of learning, not just within putting together the summative. So what we're doing here is using the industry professionals to provide sort of formative feed forward really to the students to prepare for their assessment so that when they're putting together their reports they're able to get feedback from not just their tutors but from industry um, professionals so that they can then adjust their approach before putting in together that final assessment for report much as you would do within work rather than just producing the piece of work you gain that consultation with colleagues and we found that students have 
felt really felt confident more of understanding the standards and that they would need to show and not just from a university perspective but going into industry and actually having that continuous involvement with people within the workplace and the roles they're actually looking to go into it's helping them to understand the knowledge that they're putting in and they're building and they're putting into their assessment how they would take that into the workplace we'll go to the next slide please Sarah thank you so within so this is an example from the law school of how we've use authentic assessment so within a muting assessment and uh, yeah this is an online example uh, that was adapted and how this has been made more authentic is by students having a, a choice of a questions that they would have so that they can then learn from them the, the kind of real world questions that they would have to adapt to but having that level of autonomy over what particular areas they're going to focus on and that really has helped to kind of reduce that anxiety around that assessment particularly in such a kind of open assessment in terms of the muting and they could then put that together in an audio response based on their own analysis of those particular questions um, so in that way they're, they're learning around their own interests but also able to develop their particular skills that's most relevant to them so it's more but it's kind of competency based really preparing them for that professional practice going forward uh, rather than just being given a set of questions and um, that's going across the whole cohort and uh, next slide please Sarah <laughs> thank you uh, so uh, from our science and technology school, we're uh, particularly focused on how we replace the exams by looking more at um, kind of case study approaches. So rather than having the traditional sort of essay style questions, students are actually manipulating the real data using diagnostic images to actually be solving a challenge. So it's giving, again, that more real life experience and more engagement in terms of how they're having an individual involvement in that rather than just commenting on what could be done. And in that world, way, they're able to actually experience how that data might be used, how they, what they might do based on what they've been learning uh, to be able to solve that particular challenge. And then, the research that they're doing in order to benefit them in that assessment again has real world meaning because they're actively looking for how they can solve that particular problem rather than it being presented uh, as a traditional exam that they're preparing for so it kind of becomes more work life for them and gives them that experience that they can then take into industry and another example from science technology so this is a good example of how we take a kind of traditional sort of online multiple choice style questions but it's become again more autonomous for the student to be able to conduct digital investigations so what they're doing here is looking particularly at the data um, and this is around a crime forensic investigation so they're given the raw data that needs to be investigated uh, before they can answer the question. So what is now assessing is their skills to be able to analyze that data and come up with the solutions. Um, and they're given all of those files on a on the virtual memory stick. So a kind of virtual area that they could use to, to find the data, look at the different files, look at all the evidence um, for this particular investigation before they can then go in and answer the question so it gives them that time to kind of prepare for it a way as you would do within the work gathering the evidence analyzing the evidence before answering the questions rather than just again sort of trying to remember all the answers within that particular exam style they're actually actively involved in that process of learning Oops, I think this might be our last example, I think. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so um, and this is just a, a another version of how we're using sort of the industry to uh, help help make that it more real and valuable we're having those industry contact tax throughout as part of the assessment and I think what, what this is really showing is that we could, how authentic assessment can be as authentic as having consultancy projects where you're working with industry uh, throughout the whole completion of the assessment or it can be more simple in terms of just making one change on an online format where students are using real data or finding that real data so what we try to show these case studies is a bit of a, a spectrum uh, because we appreciate that not everybody can have industry context with every single module and consultancy based report so we want that breadth of assessment um, as well throughout all the modules um, what, what we're particularly looking here with the consultancy is using external resources and um, external information it's external contacts to directly work with the students who are challenged to, um, to overcome a real world issue and work with the consultant offering solutions for a real life organization and in this way they're not only developing the skills but they're also showing that social responsibility in terms of how they're contributing to society and trying to make a, a difference through the recommendations that they're putting together as part of this assessment, working closely with the um, organized, uh, external organisations as part of the consultancy to know that it's in line with the kind of standards and expectations that they're expected to put together. Thank you, Sam, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so just to just to summarise, we, we've gone through a range of different examples of case studies of where we've used this authentic assessment as a way to try to address inclusivity, but also prepare students better for the workplace. And really to us, it's become very clear that there are benefits of the students. We're still obviously analysing data, um, but certainly we are looking at closely at these attainment gaps. There's obviously therefore benefits to the institution that hopefully our students will go out and they'll have a better experience, we'll get better NSS, um, reduce attainment gaps and um, uh, do better on things like graduate outcome surveys. We, that's the aim, but also for professional bodies as well. Just we are hopefully through these approaches preparing our students better for that that professional um, move that they will make once they leave us. So what we really would like to to do at this point, and I am aware of time, but we have put together a Padlet. There's a QR code there, and in a minute I will post the link into the chat as well. But what we'd like is if you've got some examples that you're currently doing, that would be really helpful for myself and Manish so we can get a feel of what's out there, um, find what other institutions are doing. Um, but also putting yourself in the position of as somebody who is employing students, employing these graduates, how do you expect them to actually communicate their knowledge in the workplace so that we can start to, to share ideas of what is more authentic forms of assessment and obviously within looking at inclusivity. If you do put up an example of, of how professionals may communicate in their workplace, could you please identify the discipline or the profession? It just helps us to keep it a closer track of, of the information that you provide. And really just remembering that this definition of authentic assessment is as an assessment that calls the students to utilise the same set of knowledge, competencies and attitudes that they should apply in the criterion situation in real life. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. And the um, Padlet link into the chat. Manish, I don't know if you're yes. still on the call. Yes, yes. There's a question um, for, I think, just... Sam, uh, when she was you. presenting one of the slides. There was a question by Fiona. Uh, I don't know, Fiona, if you want to ask the question yourself, uh, maybe. Oh, you replied. OK. I have just put something together, yeah. <laughs> Super deep, anyway. Sorry, I couldn't see see the chat so i have put the um the link for the padlet into the chat um and manish if we could maybe leave that open yes and, yes anybody that's... who listens to the recording can also were there any other questions uh, i think no they've already been answered so i'll just um 
we'll see if anybody's actually inputting to the Padlet. <laughs> yeah, Fiona was trying to unmute. So do you, you want to have a, a follow-up question, follow-up question, I think? So if people do need to leave, uh, I've put in a, a survey uh, basically for about our um, session. If you would like to give us some feedback and if you have anything that you are going to take as an action point and do it in your own practice, please do complete the link that I'm going to post one more time now. Just take that link with you if you're going. But anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, thank you. So um, we've already got one example up here about teacher education, so I appreciate that. But if you if you do think of any examples of how, how our graduates communicate, um, then that's a very good starting point of, of, of that backward design to actually um, how we, we align these assessments actually to that professional that we're, we're hopefully hoping to um, actually produce at the end of their studies with us. There was a question about slides being shared off, so I did said yes, because I know you, know, you, yes. you won't mind. So we will share the slides, and of course, the, the recording is going to be available later on <clears throat> on the All South YouTube channel. <clears throat> OK, I'm not sure if it's still, is it still showing my screen or not? Uh, no, it's just the camera at the minute. OK. Um... Is that uh, icon that says right? There we go. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, yeah that, that's us. Thank you, Manish. Yes, we can see the Padlet now. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And that's the main hall on the campus I work on, just because it's a pretty background. <laughs> So we do hope that uh, you know uh, these wonderful examples that have been shared have inspired people to, uh, to to do something in their own practice as well. They're wonderful because you know authentic assessment. Uh, the may is, is is this is all, all uh, when I saw them first time I was amazed, uh, and I hope uh, the same has happened to other people as well. Um, yeah. So please uh, um, ask any questions. And I have put my. Uh, Hmm. I've put my email address in the chat if anybody wants to contact me directly as well. Okay, and uh, people, oh, there you go. There's another question from Nina in the chat. It says, does NTU have a repository of these case studies that I can share with colleagues? Um, I believe that I'll talk to the other learning teaching managers just because we have a shared ownership of these. Um, but I think, Sam, we'd probably be quite happy to put them on the um, uh, National Teaching Repository. OK, so there we go. That's so the answer. I've... Yeah, thank you. Um, I can't stop sharing my screen, so I do apologize. Don't, don't worry, don't worry. There's, there's a question from Colette. Um, this is a hard question, something that I think we all want to be able to do, but hard to put into practice. Uh, so, so thanks <clears throat> for sharing examples across different disciplines. Yes, that's uh, how I felt as well when I first saw these wonderful examples. I think, I think um, Kate did an awful lot to get us doing it. <laughs> We didn't have much choice, did we? Yes, the pandemic, uh, those things. Um, then we have another maybe question. It says, how have you worked with colleagues to redesign, encourage the redesign of their assessments? And how have, and how have you engaged employers? Or is this devolved to individual academic schools? So that's a very good question. Practical, yes. That, that's yeah that's that is a very good um so i think both in my role and sam's role as learning and teaching manager we work closely with with academics and professional surfaces within our schools um sometimes yes it's down to an individual who's very motivated um but we are seeing increasing engagement we also have a very strong steer um that we do need to have assessed work-like experience across our courses um, so from the VC downwards into, to, to support us with the graduate outcome survey. Um, so this is very much a 
top down approach but i think also we as we're maybe less less shackled to some of the 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 traditions because we are a post 92 um so i think we're often we're encouraged to um explore new approaches to, to be confident, to try things, and not to be afraid to fail. And I think that that comes from a culture that that's very student focused, and in this is ours is that our access and participation plan is is within our university is our success for all. But it's it's across everything that we do, and it's very much a responsibility of, of every academic as well. So I think that that does motivate. Um, there'll obviously be areas where you get better buy-in than, than others, but certainly we have very good links with the local community, with um, local employers. We have, um, Sam mentioned them, we have very good alumni um, relationships that we, we maintain and we build. Um, so I think, I think all of that helps. And as well, with digital technology, the world's become much smaller, so we can draw on people from a much broader range if we're using online platforms as well yeah I think I'd say as well I think we're still very much still at the beginnings of this as well I mean within my school in the business school we're just undergoing assessment review at the moment and just looking at how people are interpreting particularly these on the data assessments in different ways and offering those workshops for people to redesign them once we've got kind of a shared understanding, particularly post pandemic and, and where it's moving. And yeah, as Sarah said, our Luma firms have been brilliant being involved in helping to collaborate with that. And I, I certainly found it in the pandemic, I teach um, one of my topics is zoo nutrition and I couldn't get students out to, to zoos and behind the scenes as I normally would do or that link with keepers and um, working and approaching um, industry um across across the world they, they were quite happy to invest time making videos of maybe authentic scenarios so that the students could then explore them provide feedback and then they actually got feedback directly from the employers as well so it started to build these networks and this this cultural cultural um development of students so again i think we are fortunate that we we value our alumni and employers but also we do have these you know things like uh, teams etc um it makes us the world far easier to, to work with okay then there's another question from fiona uh, in the chat is how flexible are your qa processes for making innovative changes to assessments uh we i think qa wise we're, we're very we're rigorous um we obviously have to go through so, so there are cutoff points so that we can't make changes to the following year etc but i think we also recognize the need that we do have to be flexible and we do have to respond to our students um so as learning teaching managers we all have a very good relationship with our quality managers we work very closely with them and also the center for academic development and quality which mel is part of and um, right from our design sprint our, our designing of new curriculum throughout this is very much considered within course design as well as within existing ones as well i hope that answers your questions you know there's another question from there's a, there's a question from charlie uh, she's asking did you provide support for staff to develop suitable assessment criteria for these new assessments for the new assessments yeah within the business school we've moved to online grading rubrics so as part of that work it has been putting together guidance and um, for staff to be putting together that assessment criteria and yeah that's been particularly important moving to some of these different forms of assessment so we have kind of regular workshop and, and guidance support in those with that assessment criteria that kind of bank that we put together um, as part of moving towards the rubric system. Okay, hope that answers. And there's some response uh, to David's question in the chat, uh, if David is still around. Um, then there's another question from Fiona about uh, the APP. You mentioned the APP, how connected are your digital education teams uh, regarding the tech that is provided and working from the WP teams? any participation teams any yeah it's um yeah we they work we work centrally i think we work across we have very good um collaborations across professional 
services as well. So we, we have regular forums, reg regular meetings, um, and certainly because it's 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 a very top down approach in terms of that that we all buy into it as well. But I think DT are very supportive with this. We also have the flex team um, who 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 solely focus on moving things online or or supporting blended learning, and that support's available for all all colleagues as well. Okay, okay. Thank you for that response. Is there any more questions? Uh, no, I think yeah. There is a question again from David, but I think it's uh, Melanie. Um, if you can take that and respond, please. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm seeing that people are leaving. I'm just hoping that you will complete our um, form, which is just a, like a feedback for the session. But also, if you've taken back something today and if you want to implement a change into your practice um in your or, or or your colleagues practices practice in in your own institution uh do do um post that in 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 the form i can push the link again one more time any further questions from anyone uh, we're very close to to the end now Apologies, it took me so long to work out how to stop sharing the screen. So sorry about that. <laughs> I think mostly the question has been answered. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, just on time, so we're going to finish the session, stop the recording now. Ooh, where is it?